Reserve Bank of India Chair Professor at IIM Bangalore and Honorary Fellow Scotch Development Foundation, Dr. B. Yeram Raju, Independent Consultant, and Mr. Sunil Kulkarni, Deputy Managing Director, Oxygen. Uh, Mr. Narendra, I also invite you to join the discussion, please. Uh, with this, I uh, hand, hand this uh, discussion over to uh, Mr. Dave to uh, take the proceedings forward. So good afternoon, <coughs> a heavy session after a heavy lunch, so we'll try to make it as simple as possible and uh, I have pleasure in introducing my colleagues here on the panel, starting with uh, Dr. Narendra, who is a retired chairman and managing director of Indian Overseas Bank. Uh, we have uh, Sri Sunil Kulkarniji, he is with uh, Oxygen and uh, intensively working with uh, financial sector. Professor Charan Singh uh, is a IM chair professor, RBI chair professor at IM Bangalore and Professor uh, Raju. The theme is uh, something to do with the overall theme of this two-day event and I thought uh, it will be interesting to listen to all the panelists here. Let me initiate by saying that uh, <coughs> deciding on what is the priority when it comes to the flow of financial services, especially the credit, is never an easy job. There are competing sectors, competing regions, competing segments of the society, which will always get prioritized. I did not mention competing sub-sectors of the rural economy and the urban economy. Now, who is going to decide where the credit should flow? Ideally, credit should flow, classical theories would tell us, that where there is profit. Money chases the profits. And uh, look at what happened since 1969 when the banks were nationalized and the word priority got introduced. And that priority still continues to bother all of us, keeps us on our toes in terms of thought process, keeps Central Bank, the regulator, also worried about what should be classified as priority and what should be removed out of the list of priority. Lot of stakeholders are involved in this and I can only say for any regulator, any central bank, this is one of the most difficult job. And regulator and central bank always looks at the academic inputs, the feedback from the sector, feedback from the practitioners, and then arrives at certain broad guidelines. Now, question is whether do we really need something called priority? That would be <coughs> a first quick uh, round of uh, feedback from the panelist. When the country is uh, witnessing a substantial growth rate, should credit flow high growth sectors only or it should also look at the growth sectors which are not generating enough in terms of their contribution to GDP. I will give an example of agriculture for instance. The contribution to GDP is around now 14, agriculture contribution, but you would find that RBI would ask banks to pump in 18% of net bank credit 
to agriculture. Look at what is happening to the service industries, look at what is happening to MSME, micro, and the industries. So with this broad background, this topic <coughs> is strictly not a financial, you know, financial sector domain. I would say it's more of an economic sector uh, business, business case. And uh, with these uh, opening remarks, I would first flag off this issue, the, whether India still needs something called priority. And if so, why? And uh, may I invite uh, Sri Narendra ji, Dr. Narendra Sahib to share his long, long innings in banking sector and reflect on how a banker would like to reflect on this. Good afternoon to all of you. I, I have, a, or as a guest, I have been added to the panel. However, as he rightly mentioned, last 40 years we were all doing the same work of uh, giving credit to the needy and the deserving uh, customers and uh, the priority sector has all, all along been the uh, priority for the banks. Apart from the Reserve Bank uh, guidelines, uh, most of the banks uh, coverage of branches, most around 60% are being in rural areas and semi-urban areas. And the new branches which are also being 25% uh, being unbanked uh, such villages, uh, the opportunity for very stable and sound lending comes from that areas. And uh, recently the Reserve Bank, because uh, all along when I see rightly mentioned, this has been a debatable at the uh, highest level, whether the priority sector is all inclusive, whether it really takes into account the real priority for the country, and uh, whether uh, rule-based or directional-based credit is important or it should be on uh, the individual uh, bank objectives of reaching out. So there have been a, some type of, uh, uh, recently there have been a guideline that social infrastructure and also in terms of uh, the warehousing or uh, other supply chain management and uh, some of the initiative of the government are also being included. So ideally one important area is agriculture. NABAD has been uh, taking a lot of initiative that uh, in the, this particular area. And I am very happy that in the budget, uh, quite a lot of money has been allocated to uh, through the NABARD uh, for various schemes. And NABARD has been mentioning that apart from the crop loan, like you no know, more than around 8 lakh crores, yearly around 1, 1 and a half lakh crores of incremental agriculture credit. But it is mostly short term loan, crop loan. Whereas ideally banks should uh, focus on creating more uh, investment-based agricultural growth. Unless uh, there is a long-term development of uh, uh, soil or long-term development of uh, water uh, related or irrigation facilities or in terms of providing uh, uh, equipments and providing the total ecosystem which will facilitate long-term uh, sound uh, agriculture. And uh, because when we found that this much credit has been given, but the productivity per agricultural, uh, uh, what you call, per hectare of land is not been in line with the requirement. So now the currently in all the SLBC level, uh, according to the NABARD credit budget, uh, more than 50-60% are now earmarked for investment credit. Uh, that may go into it because now all of you are aware that a new green revolution has to take place. In spite of all that, the agriculture, apart from the natural disaster or uh, various things, the overall agriculture growth has been very poor. And unless we, uh, India achieves around 4% growth in the agriculture, your other uh, manufacturing or service sector alone will not lead to our uh, desired level of at least 8.5% plus uh, GDP growth. So we have, uh, uh, in spite of that, now the latest thing you are also seeing the, uh, the various suicide and all. So the agriculturally, uh, in terms of that, we and NABARD, along with the Reserve Bank and the Government of India and all the banks, including uh, private, public and foreign banks, we have to, and the new banks coming, we have to do a lot of work 
uh, agriculture and other agriculture related activities. Even the allied activities, there are quite a lot of success stories, but they have not been uh, uh, taken in other areas where there is an opportunity because we were just discussing now financial inclusion. Unless we ensure the people are gainfully employed, people's uh, level of uh, standard of living goes up, their disposable income increases and they are engaged in a total full period of their uh, time uh, because the agriculture is also seasonal. Uh, so there are may not be three crops, somewhere it is only one crop. How are you may going to ensure the other plantations or other long-term uh, agriculture there or other activities? So the one area of priority in amongst the prioritization is the agriculture. The second, of course, the government has been uh, mentioning about the Make in India program. Now, the manufacturing sector contribution has not been up to the mark. So, there have to be so many uh, schematic uh, cluster uh, development. The Mudra Bank may be the one where the micro enterprise above 50,000 above are being covered through the funding the unbank. Uh, but it is in the initial stage. It is yet to be get into the and it is totally clean. So, how futuristically this uh, funding will enable the uh, money to be safe. Uh, that has to be seen. However, uh, banks are all giving at least 20% uh, growth in the micro and uh, uh, small uh, loans and 10% growth in the number of accounts and around 65% the credit of the total MSME goes to the micro. Uh, this as a target people have been e e achieving, but as an economic activity, as the uh, informal sector of such activity getting covered through the formal uh, credit linkage and then contributing to the national growth or the national uh, prioritization, I think there we have to go into a deep, deep into that. Similarly, provide the ecosystem and supply chain management and uh, linkage of rural crafts to the national stream of marketing, getting the economic value for them and removing the other uh, hurdles for them and ease of bus doing business. I think uh, in this area there is a lot to be work to be done. The third sector is our service sector, uh, whatever we are going to get uh, such around 10 percent growth, uh, it is primarily related to export oriented. Other than the professional and other uh, related services, maybe including uh, uh, hospitality or hotel or restaurant or other activities. But we are not been able to get new lines of service sector or we are not able to get newer people into service. So if we have to sustain the GDP growth, the service sector which has been the greatest contributor of that, which has been finding extremely difficult in the international area of exports uh, to keep pace with their earlier growth, uh, needs to be found new clusters of such a service activity, for which I think uh, a lot of uh, idea from the Reserve Bank or the government and uh, NABAD or such other agency, particularly SIDBI, has to go into that and promote because uh, traditionally banks are more uh, are what you call comfortable in funding manufacturing activities, but the credit dispensation in the service sector has been very poor. So there has to be uh, more focus on that. So overall I say that the India's requirement is infrastructure, whether it is a social infrastructure, rural infrastructure, or the urban uh, uh, renewal infrastructure, and the, like the creation of uh, uh, other basic necessities like water, health, and urban, uh, what you call, and also the smart cities. Now, can, can all these could be, again, in a different level of uh, prioritization? Now, if you don't give a priority to these concepts of the uh, government, uh, it will only remain as a government program, but it may not be remain as the program of the bankers. So, there has been, but the banks have given money and they are in a slightly difficult position of uh, little NPA in these infrastructure areas. But leaving aside this particular uh, present uh, focus, even the budget has given more than 70,000 crores for infrastructure over and above the normal location. So I think that uh, has to be arrived at a, also a part of the prioritization. But maybe in relation to the more than the 40 percent target cannot be a separate uh, uh, allocation of target for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Professor Charan Singh has uh, extensively worked on the financial inclusion space. And I thought when we uh, look at the entire gamut of priority sector, 
and one of the delivery mechanism for deepening the impact the channels of financial inclusion which are now currently going on i thought let me ask a question to professor charan singh whether the present financial inclusion approach whether it will be able to effectively address the demand side and also sustain the supply side the delivery mechanisms if i have your permission uh, i would like to start with the previous question and i had some thoughts on it and then i'll reflect on this question actually if you look at the priority sector lending historically when did it start and why did it start i think the answer to the question which has been raised by the chairperson here lies in there remember 1965 and i'm sure some of us were already there and remember what happened in 1965 apart from the indo pak war there was severe agriculture problems 1966 1967 these problems were rising agriculture production was down and because of that industrial production was down and our exports were low it is then that we started talking in terms of priority sector lending the whole story of priority sector lending was formalized by about 1971 and then the complete structure of what should be the percentage what would be the sectors got as got established by 1974 40% of the resources have to be directed also called directed lending now the key question is that right from 1965 onwards we started thinking about priority sector lending and that is the time when we did not have nabard we did not have sidbi we did not even have an exim bank we did not have idbi all these institutions that came up came up basically with the focus on all those areas which were part of priority sector lending we did not even apart from nationalizing state bank of india way back in 1955 in 1966 67 when we started thinking of priority sector we did not have so many public sector banks then the key qu key question right now is when we have nationalized our banks in 69 followed by another bout of nationalization in 1980 1982 nabard comes up and priority sector big component is agriculture and rural sector funding of course the industrial bank has passed through its history idbi came into existence and then went away but sidbi is there we have already established mudra bank and before that we did the jandhan yojana is priority sector lending relevant as of now to my mind 40% ratio that we have lived with for last 5 decades probably needs to be looked at and revised i think there has to be flexibility in the term priority sector lending what would become part of priority sector for how long will it be part of priority sector that needs to be determined second point on one hand we want our commercial banks to compete with the best in the world and on the other hand we tie their hands back and tell them that 40% of whatever they lend has to be directed lending and at subsidized rate obviously banks are not able to achieve it because it goes against the very grain of commercial banking the very grain of any commercial enterprise is profits and profits only come where you put your best foot forward to get the best return consequently what happens commercial banks are not able to fulfill their targets and then the money flows into ridf which comes into nabard so my thoughts on the first question of priority sector lending would be a time has come when we need to relook as to is priority sector lending relevant today 
And why? Especially because we have nationalized banks. We have specialized banks like Sidbi and Nabad focused in that area. We have now Mutra Bank. And thirdly, because we want our banks to be commercially successful. And therefore, we need to think whether we can impose the same limits. Coming to the relevant question put to me directly as to the latest measures that have been announced for financial inclusion, are they sustainable? Firstly, are they in the right direction? And secondly, are they sustainable? I have been working on these issues for a long time now. And right now, as a professor, I have been doing surveys in areas around Bangalore. My reading is that in this country, before we started Jandhan, we had 1.28 lakh crore accounts operating in the banking system. We had 28 crore accounts in the post offices. Under the Jandhan, we have opened 13 crore accounts now. These 13 crore accounts are not the low-lying fruit. They, despite the fact that we nationalized the State Bank of India in 55 and other banks in 69 and 80, we were not able to pluck these fruits. They are very, very expensive because they're either deep into the country or they do not have the capacity to hold any balances which would make their operation commercially viable for a commercial bank. They are a cost. Therefore, my worry is, do the banks have the resources to service these 13 crore accounts as they stand today? These are the accounts which have lots of expectations from the agencies. And the commercial banks do not have the supply side, neither of instruments, nor of skilled manpower to handle and service these accounts. So that is one worry that I have and I do not see a skilling program. I do not see the recruitment program in commercial banks that they will be able to go and do this. You would obviously come back and tell me that, Professor, have you not heard of a term called business correspondent or a business facilitator? I have. And my reading from the survey in the region is that you and me, despite being in cities, will not rely parting our money to somebody whom we only know for a few months. And why do we think a rural person for whom money is dearer, more dearer, would be willing to part? So the business correspondents have a high attrition rate and people in rural areas tell me that business correspondents do not inspire the same amount of confidence that we have in a brick and mortar branch. And therefore, it will take time for a business correspondent to establish, inspire confidence and start transacting business from that rural uh, account. There could be other mechanisms and I would agree with that, that you could have kiosks, you could have ATM machines, that is true, but that needs time and that planning has not been done. As far as the demand side is concerned, during my surveys, I'm finding many people, and this survey that I had conducted was just before Jandhan was launched. So I, I'm sorry, I do not know. After Jandhan, I've gone on a very few village visits, so I do not have concrete substantive uh, evidence to tell you what happened after Jandhan in a, in a substantive manner with a good sample, but I'm telling you my inputs which were just before the Jandhan. I came across many people who said they do not have the balances, they do not need a bank account. You can call it two things. One, you can say a failure of ours to tell them that a bank account is far more essential to them than their daily toothpaste. Probably we have not done that. The second issue could be far more genuine, which of course I don't agree, but it could be genuine to some extent. They really do not have the need for a bank account. 
and that is why the reluctance despite the very best efforts done by banks and the government. I think those are the issues that are coming up uh, on the Jandhan. So, would it be successful? I'm sure it will be successful. But it will need time, it will need planning, it will need skill formation at the side of the bankers. It will also need extensive drive on financial literacy to make people aware that a bank account is essential for them, if not today, at least in next two to five years. Thank you. Thank you, Charan Singh Sam. Uh, the entire financial inclusion space today, it's complete metamorphosis of the way banking used to happen. And this is possible only because of the technological solutions that we could find. And when we have Sri Sunil Kulkarniji, who is an important player in the entire financial inclusion, from the perspective of the technology, I thought I would flag off an issue for him. Number one, you, you are very costly. Number two, you keep changing every day, you know. Someday you have black cord, then you have a, you know, pink shirt and... And we poor banks and MFIs and, and the people in the government, we, we are not very comfortable with you. What do you advise the players sitting here as to how do you handle these kind of issues? Thank you, Mr. Dave. And since the topic is prioritizing priority sector lending, I think I'll, my thoughts will be a bit radical, but so it may be. <clears throat> what we are talking about here is priority sector lending, and what I'm going to talk about is how to enable priority sector lending. Because one of the things that Professor Charan Singh has mentioned is that 40% of the credit is going to uh, a location where it is not profitable. And one of the reasons why it is not profitable is not because the inability of the consumer to pay. It is the cost of repayment. Today, we have created Janadhan accounts, and these accounts have been created by bank branch managers and the officials going to village, setting up a camp, opening the bank account, and going back. So I call that is that, you know, piyasa kuhe ke paas jane ki wajai, kuha piyasa ke piyas ke so you have gone there, and now you have gone back. So now, if you have to do transactions, still the consumer has a bank account, he does not have a means to transact. And because he does not have a means to transact does not mean, Dr. Yunus has already proven with Gramin, that ability to pay is never a question mark. It is the cost at which he is paying is the biggest challenge. And that's, if we have to mean, uh, enable priority sector lending, first we need to reduce the cost of priority sector lending. And that is where it will become profitable. Now, all of us have bank account. Why? Because our salary gets credited. And we have no option but to use our bank account because the salary is getting credited. What happens to the rural? The benefit subsidy has to get credited to the bank account to make the account active. Then he will say, OK, I need a bank account. And that is what I think government is trying to say, that 3 lakh crore of subsidy will go to a bank account. Now, today we have 2 lakh BCs, so-called, out of which maybe 1 lakh are transacting. We push ourselves hard, create 3 lakh BCs nationwide, which means we are banking 50% of the villages, 6.5 lakh villages, we are bank 50% of them. Now, 3 lakh crore subsidy, and I'm talking about pure numbers, so I think these numbers will prove the business case that I'm talking about. These 3 lakh crore needs to go to 3 lakh BCs which means every BC has to do one crore transaction in a year, rupees one crore worth of transaction in a year, which means eight lakh. Eight lakh rupees per month is the transaction that the BC needs to do. And I'm taking very average case. There will be some, be some people who will do five lakh, there will be some people who will do 50 lakh, depending upon whether the village is 20,000 or 10,000 or 2,000 population village. If 8 lakh rupees worth of transactions are to be done, and we are assuming that the pain of the consumer is taken over by the BC, and he is going to the bank, and the consumer is not going to the bank. So the BC is going at least twice a week to the bank, which means eight rotation of his capital. 
if we have eight rotation of the capital for eight lakh rupees, he needs capital of one lakh rupee. Is there a business case for this BC agent to be given credit? RBI has come up with a policy in April 2014 that national business correspondent who are more than two years in operation should be given credit by given 15% cash. If you give 15% cash, you get this. As on date, I don't think any bank has implemented that. Now, before we bank the customer, at least let us give credit to the BC. If we don't give credit to the BC, how this rotation is going to happen? And that's where the bulk of the problem is, that the attrition of BC, he doesn't have capital. If he does not have one lakh rupee capital, now talking about the business case, he earns, let's say, half percent for cash in, cash out. We are talking about one lakh rupee rotated eight times. Eight times half percent is four percent in a month. Four percent in a month means 48 percent per annum. Is this BC's business case not viable to get 15 percent uh, priority sector loan from bank? But the moment banks get involved, they will say no. We need collateral, we need his property, we need his land, we need his all this. But when telecom licenses were issued, the telecom licenses were issued on the basis of business case of cash flow based license, uh, financing. Where the business model was created, initially you had less infrastructure, you are keep, uh, having less subscriber, less revenue, but as you are maintaining more and more services, your business case become positive. Here from day one, you are having business case positive, where he is earning 48% return on the basis of a business model where the money is sure to get transferred to a bank account where he's supposed to do cash. So my uh, take on this is that before we do priority, prioritization of priority sector lending, let us first enable the, the enablers to the priority sector lending and reduce the cost of lending. Because the bulk of the cost today, why microfinance agencies and the Sahukar, uh, I think Mr. Pathak has gone, Mr. Sa Pathak was saying Sahukar charges 36% or 40% because Today, the business case for consumer is still more than 40%. So he is still taking an unsecured credit. We are going from one extreme of unsecured credit of 40% to a fully secured credit with collateral where we can do 14% or 15%. If we are able to do on the pure business case, on the pure business case, if you are able to do 15% uh, or 18%, I have no uh, doubt that this particular business of BC will become viable and you probably have not 3 lakh, you'll have 4 lakh BC points and they have a business model to play around with because just like all of us are having credit to salary account, there will be uh, 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 money going to the uh, bank account by, by means of subsidy and I just picked up 3 lakh crore subsidy which is government subsidy, it is sure shot. Then you have international remittance which is 70 billion dollar is another 4 lakh crore. Then you have domestic remittance, which is another 2 lakh crores. Then you have recharges, bill payment, which is 7 lakh crore as part of Bharat bill payment system. So I don't think if we have a BC agent point, which is able to do all these services, how do we enable it? In urban, we all have distributors who are providing liquidity. And we pay them for the distributor. And I'm talking about the real model, which is what Oxygen is doing. By the way, we have 1.3 lakh outlets across the country. And we do about 8,000 crore of gross transaction value. So we are, out of 5,000 BC points that we created for State Bank of India, 4,000 are in rural. So we have gone to rural, created a business model where it becomes viable and it's a permanent establishment. And if you'd see that how we can make it, all these revenue streams are available, but what we don't have is the liquidity at the BC agent level. If we ensure that we prioritize the priority sector lending to BC agent, and that's why Professor Charan Singh said, what needs to be lent and who needs to be lent is not necessarily only agriculture. The guy who is actually enabling the agriculture payments and disbursement need also is part of priority sector lending. And if you do that, I have no doubt that the cost of lending will go down and it becomes a profitable business. Because for somebody to earn 48%, he will not, he'll not default on 15%. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunil. Uh, Dr. Raju is based out of Hyderabad. He is an independent consultant and a keen observer of the financial sector. Uh, Raju sir, what I was wondering is that all these efforts succeed if the client succeed. 
whatever definition you want to give to the priority sector or non priority sector banks succeed only when the clients succeed now how would you like to relate the banking sector to the real sector in terms of ensuring the success of client we heard about the technological support which is now available you you have a new government in place in states as well as in center a lot of new initiatives are being rolled out how do you see uh, you know likely success of individual clients of the banking system uh, at the outset let me thank the scotch for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts how do how do we really prioritize the priority sector is one question the other question is how do we really make the client a, a better client for the banks to accept him as a viable proposition this is the other important question that you have uh, very rightly raised in fact this priority has been uh, introduced at a time when social banking was there the moment it moved to the platform of commercial banking all banks started feeling nervous about it and that nervousness led the banks to give pressure to the uh, reserve bank of india also to take away the priorities on a different platform shift the priorities into a different platform if you look at the narsimhan committee recommendations number 1 where the prioritization has been asked to be really liquid into and directed lending portfolio to be really liquid into the basic idea is how to make this sector a, a viable sector and how long do you subsidize this sector and make it viable and who will have to subsidize it is credit a public good credit is certainly not a public good if it is accepted then is this a social good is a public good if it is not a public good when you have got into social banking on what principle you have got into social banking and who should subsidize the public good it is the government that should subsidize the public good it is not certainly the banks therefore the cost of lending has to be met by somebody and cost of lending in rural areas and semi urban areas has been going up and any supervised credit will have additional cost and in rural semi urban areas it has to be more supervised credit because credit has to go with extension and supervision and if credit has to go with extension and supervision it carries more cost than what it is in the urban areas therefore banks have preferred more armchair lending than to the supervised and you know uh, ex uh, extension support lending that's how the priority sector targets have never been achieved in order to make the reserve bank feel that we are achieving priority sector make government of india feel that we are achieving priority sector they have gone into a different uh, you know uh, alchemy i would say and they have been starting uh, different types of dialogue why don't you include exports into this after all export is a viable entity for financing exports why do i as a banker i need somebody to prioritize but if only when exports are viable when exports are profitable i get into export trade i don't get into export trade because somebody is subsidizing me certainly not then why should it be a priority sector why should it require somebody else to prod me to get into a priority sector therefore i would say that the band of priority sector now introduced is itself defective they want to be really prioritized second one if you look at after all the uh, how do you really make the cost intensity come down what efforts have banks really put in to bring down the cost of lending i don't see any in this direction because dr chakravarty has been uh, crying hoards for nearly 5 years asking them to see how do you reduce the cost of lending but he has not been able to succeed in his cry you know the other important area that you will find here is the leverage provided to the banks not to achieve the priority sector lending targets particularly in agriculture sector if you don't achieve put it in ridf what is ridf ridf is a treasury business after all what is to be done by government in terms of infrastructure 
now banks are asked to do and they they could go to the public and raise funds for investment purposes in infrastructure and not certainly depend on the banks for this purpose not certainly because but nabat found it very convenient and comfortable because they could get good treasury business good profit good arm chair lending whereas if it is pure agriculture lending they have to put in more resources more supervision more direction and more collaboration with the uh, primary lenders as they were doing in the rdc you know that shift has taken place very swiftly because it is very attractive and uh, you know it's a very good magnet the other thing that you will find is uh, in relation to targets themselves nowhere they have achieved the target in agricultural sector ever since its creation as how this 40% have come to be created how this 18% has been devised there is no basis please remember when they put it at 30% there was no basis when they made it to 33% there was no basis when they made it to 40% there was no basis and i fully agree with dave uh, whether it is whether it has any relationship to gdp no because at that time if it was related to gdp that <laughs> the time at which it was created 30% the total 30% would have gone to agriculture because the share of gdp at that time was 38% when they have created in 1969 gdp share was 30 i mean 42% i think uh, it has come down from 50% in uh, independent time to for the present 69 so they have not given 43% they gave only 18% therefore there is no rational in fixing a particular uh, you know allocation so allocative efficiency in priority sector i would say is almost next to nothing there is no allocative efficiency the other thing is only 12% has been continuously achieved see 12% 14% maximum that they have achieved why won't they recognize this and say that yes banks can achieve only this much and therefore i give only 14% target 15% target for agriculture why do you aim at 18 percent allow them not to achieve it and then divert it to ridf and so on this i think this uh, game of foolery should stop the other thing is now they have put one, the, one more condition in the re revised uh, directions seven percent of a and b c should go for small farmers and marginal farmers if 12 percent for the total volume of total number of agricultural farmers is not achieved can 7% for SF and MF alone be achieved? Is a big question mark. It will certainly not be achieved. It may be achieved at the rate of, at the proportional rate of 12%. In which case also, the SF and MF will continue to be denied their legitimate share of credit and they will continue to go to only money lenders. This is the other angle that we will have to look at. If you look at the small borrowing accounts, recently RBI has put out the valuable information in their monthly bulletin, the very lead article, small borrowing accounts. See, 97.5% was the uh, small borrowing accounts in terms of numbers in 1999. It has gone down to 78.7% in 2014. This is the result of financial inclusion, sir. Small borrowing accounts, the borrowing accounts having uh, per capita of 2 lakhs and less, has come down to 78.7% in 2014. This is financial inclusion. The other one is, if you see per capita small borrowing account credit that has gone, it has gone up only to the extent of 2.5 times for rural and semi-urban areas during the period 2000 to now, compared to six times of the same class of borrowers in terms of per capita borrowing in urban and metro areas. Six times it has gone. See, this is the way in which we have looked at the small borrower. Small borrower is an insecure borrower. Therefore, what they have done? They have done, they have tried to give cushion in terms of extending guarantee cover. Let us see how this guarantee cover also has been worked out. CGT MSC. Credit Guarantee Trust for Micro and Small Enterprises. And this Micro and Small Enterprises definition also, if you look at the re redefined Micro Small Enterprises definition, again they have put exports there. 
micro small enterprises can never export independently individually because exports is an aggregation unless somebody does the aggregation and seeks credit for export of the goods produced by micro small enterprises exports cannot go from them that means this will target will be an unachievable target unachieved target and this target where would it go unachieved target will go for again bonds of cb or bonds of rig therefore you are creating a target which is una which unachievable and pushing it on the banks and banks will ultimately say you please divert it why do you do this i think as the bank of india they should go into when they go into actual performance and the psyche of the banks and the way in which banking is moving way in which banks are wanting to move and want the even the government wants the banks to move after all when the, what is the guidance given by the finance minister to the public sector banks when he met they yeah, how what's your profit line why are you keeping this you know when he is asking for greater dividend how can he ask for you know social banking to go in a vigorous way he can't ask he can't have two tongues in the same cheek therefore these are all issues which are very controversial and which need to be resolved both by the government and the reserve bank of india more than anybody else thank you very much thank you, thank you. <coughs> when you have uh, years of experience and you know loads of knowledge uh, behind the individual panelists i'm sure we are not doing justice to the time which is being made available uh, before i say thanks uh, if there are any specific questions uh, we would certainly request the panelists to respond because well, it seems uh, here here yeah please Uh, will uh, will be invested from government of india and uh, in total all the commercial banks had a total number of branches 178000 that year 2000 whereas uh, postal services had all sub post offices and everything put together more than 2 lakh i, I may, may not be very correct but but i'm quoting from a 15 year old magazine i haven't seen last 15 years anyone else uh, it's it sounds a very very nice idea Uh, they have their overheads already put in place they are doing a postal service banking part of it they have deposit services and fixed deposit services and long term pension schemes also with them why can't we be talking it up again because times are changing and technology has brought about you know postal services and banking put together uh, we may be the largest banking services in the world then postal services we we are not talking about that anymore last 10 years not not much talk has happened why I think uh, post uh, post office is already applied for payment bank license, yeah, so they are going to be a bank. Uh, they just need to corporatize, and they will become a bank. So I think it it is one of the most hot topic. Topic. I am surprised you are saying it's not being talked about. It is. It's being talked about every day and every night because yeah. most of the banks also see post office as the big competition. Actually, so I think it's there being have talked been attempts about. to collaborate with the post office and the banks. in terms of uh, rural lend lending also some other place it has been successful now with that experience uh, there has also narega payment quite a lot of states post office has been involved and the later post office has gone for total uh, what you call cbs and uh, with their uh, more than 134000 units in the rural area they found found that they will be the first bank to get for universal banking but the universal banking has not been given but they as he rightly said maybe first as a remittance later they may convert into full page bank and it is a priority of the government also yeah thank you my views are my views are very different you can have a bullock cart and on the bullock cart you can put the body of a mercedes it will never become a mercedes i've been a commercial banker myself <coughs> i've been a central banker and part of my education i have traveled across a post office is a post office rather than doing a good job as a post office 
you want to get into banking because you see that's better. I don't think it works. There is a different synergy that can be brought. Post offices, 1,55,000 post offices in this country, 1,34 in the rural area. None of the post offices today have an ATM machine. None of them are electronically connected with internet facility. You can modernize the post office. You can put ATM machines on their premises. But when did the post office start a banking account? In India, post offices started somewhere in 1886. Commercial banks <coughs> did not exist then. Because post offices were there, and they had a government stamp, they started a scheme called savings bank account, basic accounting. Today, we have large number of commercial banks whose bread and butter is commercial banking. For post offices, banking is a side business and it was thrust upon them because we did not have an appropriate commercial bank. So to me, all this talk that is taking place in the last few years that making post offices banks, I think is in the wrong direction. This is a world of specialization. You are a post office, specialize. Compete with, uh, compete with the private sector companies who are doing transfer of things from one place to the other. Banking is a totally different ball game. Let the commercial banks compete with foreign banks, with private and public sector banks, but not with post offices. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any last word from you, sir? Fine. So I think uh, on behalf of all of you and myself, I must thank the distinguished panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.